Thank you very much, Mary and, and Michael, for the kind invitation. This is a, I find it rather uh, awesome to, to speak to a group that's so much uh, come through such a lot of change and is being asked to implement even more change. And I just hope that, uh, sit back and relax, this is going to be totally different to what you expect. I want to look with you at our country, at the world of work, and at the huge issue of the balance between higher education and further education and training. Uh, I'm not going to get into the, the guts, the entrails of the, the further education training strategy or Solis's corporate plan. Uh, you'll be more expert on what this may entail and how it's going to be tweaked than, than, than I. But I, I do think that a lot of what is happening, a, a lot of the ambition that is in the further education training strategy for the next uh, five years is incredibly important to the health of our economy and to the health of our society. And in a sense, I'm out there, not uh, as a, an insider in your sector, but I, I feel myself a bit as an advocate for your sector the success of what has been sketched is so important, it can't just rely on yourselves. And I will have things to say about our economy and about what we might expect over the next five, six years in the labour market that you may find surprising and which I think need to be a lot said a lot more vigorously. And I also will have things to say about the consequences and of putting so many eggs in the higher education basket and about what already you know about the stresses and the strains that this is causing and how vital to that sector also will be the success of uh, your own reforms and the ability to put flesh on the further education training strategy. So you see, it is a broad picture but believe me, uh, I do think the end result is to uh, want a lot more powerful bodies in Ireland to, to look to your sector uh, and to become stakeholders with you in seeing you succeed. Now, I know schools matter. They matter so much. Uh, and uh, you'll be aware of a wealth of really rich research coming from the longitudinal study school transitions in the Economic and Social Research Institute, underlining how important the type of school a young person attends is, how important their relationship with the school is during their secondary schooling, the subjects they choose, the level at which they sit papers, the relationship of schools with the pupils' parents, and above all, the role of guidance. And while all that is so important to the expectations and in many ways the capabilities that young people begin the transition to their adult lives and into the world of work. I'm going to say nothing more about schools. Uh, my central concern is of a more pervasive influence that I see is being exercised on the expectations and ambitions during school of young people themselves, their parents, their teachers, and their guidance counselors on what jobs are out there. What does getting a job today entail? And what real prospects have I got? And that's my apologia for speaking to you most of this morning about developments in the world of work. This morning, News Talk 106, I stopped sipping my coffee immediately at breakfast because they were discussing the crisis facing uh, guidance, uh, career guidance in the secondary school system. And I was delighted to hear it's getting exposure again. And the person being interviewed described very well the damaging impact it's having in orienting young people career pathways, 
air of having much less dedicated hours and individuals for career guidance. But the interviewer uh, then popped the question, but you're aren't too many young people beginning to go to third level anyway? What is your greater role for further education and training? And my heart collapsed when the interviewee said, well, of course, we see from the statistics that if you study in third level, you get, you're 90% more likely to get employment. And the topic wasn't pursued anymore. And I said, oh dear, what a missed opportunity. So there is, in the words of the... Uh, just recently appeared, the OECD have done a synthesis of all their country studies of skills beyond school. It's a very fine report. And they, I think, very nicely describe the pathways after school that don't go straight to third level as the hidden world. The hidden world of professional education and training. There's a quote from the report. School and third level, or school and university and the well-trod path between them play a dominant role in thinking about education policy. But outside these two pillars, there exists a less well-understood world of colleges, diplomas, certificates, and professional examinations, the world of post-secondary vocational education and training. Indeed. So, it is, I believe, perceptions of what is happening in the world of work that is affecting students in their schools and their parents. The expectations that are brought by learners to adult and community education. And of course, everything that has to do with vocational education and training programs that are specifically about accessing decent job in the emerging, uh, in our emerging economy. And as I said, the reforms on the way, I believe, are of pivotal importance, not only to yourselves, but to our economy and society. So before looking with you at why I believe what's on the way and what's going to happen to employment is much more good news than many think for your sector, just a, a few quick observations on the further education and training strategy. It, I described 2014 as the end of the beginning in the reform or in the transformation of the further education trans, uh, training sector, just the end of the beginning. And I hope that 2015 could yet be the year of the ETBs, because despite a lot consultation, uh, a lot of agonizing, and in the end, calling the shots, making the judgments, and designing the strategy, an awful lot of people, as you well know, frontline practitioners and professionals in the sector are not on board. And that's why I say they may feel they're being asked to walk someone else's talk. thought they may feel like Yeats's Irish airmen, that the objectives, the war objectives of the strategy really aren't theirs. I mean, after all, their country is the Tartan Cross, their countrymen from the Tartan Cross. And I think it's yourselves, the ETBs, that have to carry, in a sense, the message of the strategy much further and wider into the sector. And if you're not comfortable yourselves with the extent to which the strategy is good news, and is, if you're not comfortable, convinced that the strategy is not encouraging people to knock their heads against the wall, uh, well, you're hardly ever going, going, you're going to find it very difficult to make people say, gosh, uh, there's a wind in our sails, and we can now, uh, we now know we can achieve much more for our learners and we know that we're going to get the uh, really specialist help and expertise to do that. It has been difficult for many to read about the extent to which skills for the economy are now up there alongside acts of inclusion as a core.
core objective of the sector. And it's clear that what's about to be discussed, what's about to argue, was. But there is a deep thinking behind the strategy that really, once people leave school, the two things are terribly interrelated. And if even people beginning adults in community education cannot with confidence believe that at some stage down the line, they too can have the autonomy, self-reliance and the standard of living that comes with a decent employment, it totally changes their ex the expectations that they bring to their adult and community education. So I, I do think that one thing that needs to be communicated strongly is this is not an either or, this is a conflict. Just as social inclusion increases the demand for further education and training, uh, emphasizing skills for the economy increases the, ch uh, the prospects and the value and the success of, of uh, social inclusion. So enough said by Therefore, said that we are trying to move from a year that will mark the end of the beginning to a year that will be marked by yourselves taking much more of a leadership role from the solace, from the bottom education skills in bringing people to, to be extraordinarily ambitious for their learners and to realize that the strategy is pointing in many ways at which uh, supports are available and at hand. First, I want then to move from the, this reluctance to inclusion and providing skills for the economy. I want to say just, yes, there are a high profile is given to some of the negative developments that suggest mm, uh, the future belongs to graduates. And if you're not a graduate heading into the world of work, be prepared to hew stones and draw wool. Uh, there's no denying that the recession we've come through dealt very harshly with your learners or your former learners. It's extraordinary. Uh, just one chart I take from the analysis of labor market transitions done by the ESRI. They took an 18-month period uh, before the recession an 18 month period after the recession and brought a forensic and looked at well, who got jobs, who was able to leave unemployment and get a job, and who was in a job that lost it. And look at what they came up with when they, uh, when they compared the blue chart, the blue, blue lines show you the uh, percentage of people, for instance, here with a junior certificate or less. stunning. Clearly all the, if I can call them the brown bars, are higher than the blue bars because the recession, as we know, did away with a huge number of jobs in the economy. But look at how differently it, it was. It affected people by their level, highest level of education attainment. And look at the post-leaving research in particular. This has been uh, a, a surprising and a painful feature of the recession. The types of jobs that uh, PLC graduates had access to, being so reliant in many places, on many ways on domestic demand, were hammered, knocked to the floor. And holders of uh, PLC uh, lost jobs in much greater numbers than, than others. So one could give a lot more about how unevenly damage of the recession has been shouldered by young people by their level of education attainment. But there's another much deeper development going on in the world of work that is, I think, the source of much, I would argue later, only just by pessimism about the contribution that a good work education training certificate diploma can give a young person the career that can, that can lead to. And 
that's been very nicely summarized with this chart, which uh, is, is based on a very seminal study of the skills that are in, that are actually used in particular jobs. And there's a forensic bit of work done in the United States, and this uh, is been quoted endlessly now by the OECD, who realise that this has captured something very profound about what's happening to uh, the world of work in advanced countries. And here you see between 1960 and the year 2009 uh, whether jobs in classified by their s this type of skills required have been growing or declining. And you'll see first the, the, the deep black line. What's happened there? These are routine cognitive jobs characterized by the fact that they take routine cognitive tasks to do well. And it's quite stunning that that falls even faster than the, say, routine manual. We know there's less printers needed, uh, there's less technicians needed in the textile trade. That would explain the cleft down the red line. But look at how the black line has fallen faster. There's what's called routine cognitive tasks are just much in less demand in the United States and the country in general. But so generally the three lines going down, the two key words are routine or and manual. So if job description centered on manual dexterity or centered on r routine something, collapsing demand. And look at the two lines that are for which demand is soaring. And one is both of them are non-routine. The, the light green line, the top, non-routine interpersonal. Non-routine interpersonal. And the second fastly growing group, non-routine cognitive. The things they share, of course, is the word non-routine. And of course, two totally different types of jobs then that are coming on stream in large numbers in advanced economies. The non-routine cognitive is the ICT analyst, the financial services uh, strategist, the actuary, uh, the symbolic analyst, all different terms there, Dennis, uh, that are used now to describe uh, those with professional and higher degrees who are sought after in sectors like ICT, uh, like financial services. But the other fast growing group, non-routine interpersonal, we're referring here to people with customer facing skills. We're referring to the caring occupations, nurses aides in the United uh, personal care aides to describe them in the United States. Uh, anyone dealing with elderly, with young people, with uh, minority groups in the population. An extraordinary bifurcation in demand. It has led the Director General of the CBI, who brings the body to IBEC in the UK, to speak, and he was reflecting on developments in the UK economy, of his concern at, how did he put it? He saw this polarization of skills giving rise to a uh, group, uh, uh, a fundamentally unhealthy bifurcation in which you have a relatively low skilled, relatively low paid customer facing leisure sector. By the way, the light green line alongside a relatively professionalized, high-skilled, internationally trading sector, the, the light blue. So that's the type of challenge, or that's the deeper underlying trend in the labor market that's saying, gosh, we really need, you know, if you interpret that, you can interpret that this way to say, we need 
a vastly expanding higher education sector, and really that's it. The gulf for much of the uh, light green jobs, well, it's all just down to aptitude, and uh, you don't need much else. To the extent that that is happening, and that what the Director General of the CDI in Britain, as he puts it, is, is if that's correct, well, obviously upward mobility out of low-skill jobs is getting more difficult. There's no middle jobs to really, the middle jobs to go into before you begin to get ambitious and want to go into the higher level groups are disappearing. It, many people displaced, these being skilled to access the light blue line, they're competing for the lower skilled jobs and increasing an already oversupplied market. And as a result, the terms and conditions of personal care aides, of caring staff, of sales staff are being driven down. And you'll be well aware that already in Ireland, Tribunes are deeply concerned with the terms and conditions in more routine, humble service type occupations, zero hour contracts, the uh, number of people on minimum pay. So uh, that's as bad as it gets. You, you begin to say, oh, we're uh, really not going to be in huge demand, and really we'd be best, const we'd be best concentrating on just trying to ensure that what we do helps people at a later stage get into higher education. But there are other key developments underway that perhaps deserve much more attention. In the first place, what's happening at the higher end of the skills ladder is much more than simply a demand for more STEM graduates. Right in the heart of the flagship sectors, such as ICT, and biopharma, and financial services, and on the part of big inward investors, blue chip companies, there's a primary concern with skills and who can get the job done and not with educational attainment and on what campus it was acquired. There's also a healthy concern not to engage graduates on tasks for which their specific knowledge and skills are not required. The terrain that, for example, that FIT skills audit, the Fast Track Information Technology Group, have uh, been to the forefront and highlighted in Ireland. You may be aware that that organization uh, undertook a s an audit of the skills need of big IT companies in Ireland, of big IT users in Ireland, in 2012 and again this year in 2013. Results for 2014 are similar to those of 2012, but the numbers are bigger. They found that listening closely to the business development managers in these large Irish companies, in these large companies in Ireland, uh, there were immediately 7,000, there are 7,000 vacancies that they're finding hard to fill. And three quarters of those vacancies require skill sets that are described as entry level or competent. They're not jobs for experts at the level of graduates necessarily. And mo these skill sets could be addressed through uh, vocational education training programs of between uh, six months and two years. So they're with well within the capacity of your sector to produce. Behind that surprising finding, there is a quite a deep phenomenon Namely, that when you get these really transformational technologies like information technology, as, as they come on stream and are being adopted, the skill sets are quite advanced. So what the, uh, the manager of uh, uh, Facebook in Dublin described as the heroes, she said, we employ about six or seven hundred people here. The heroes are down there uh, where the big machines are and they keep the entire working, which is everyone else is up on the other floors dealing with customers, business customers, and the real customers across the road. Adopting 
a, a transformation of technology like that requires skill sets at a certain level, but when the technology is being used and applied, if you like, the, the technology is maturing, the skill sets become different. And there's no doubt that we have made a huge start in this country in ICT. Uh, it's been a huge success story for them. The transformation of power of this particular industry is still to be fully realized. And in realizing it, FET, Further Education and Training, could have a huge role. Now, the type of skills or of the, that body fit carried out, <coughs> I believe the template, much the same type of active listening to the skill sets employers are looking for needs to be brought to financial services, needs to be brought to biopharma, where there's a huge emphasis on clinical testing, how you ensure, and you need to all be reckoned with very exacting standards that the drugs are in fact safe now to bring into general use. Many of the tasks involved are well within the reach of the FEC sector to prepare people to carry out. And we clearly all, and, uh, and I think some of us are fully agreed with me on this, all publicly funded research now into skill sets, into the skills needs of the economy. Uh, should embrace what the further education and training sector as well as what higher education and tech can give us. In second place, by the way, of the relatively good news, and something that's not sufficiently emphasized, is that as well as the huge demand for graduates, uh, high level experts, the knowledge intensive international trading, competitive economy that we are committed to developing will see strong demand for some jobs that we currently describe as low skilled. There will, for example, be much larger numbers of people needed for personal caring and customer service occupations. Their skill needs are far from trivial. Is any of you, and any of us, who values good elder care, good child care, or good customer service know. And really the time is past when these occupations should be described as low skilled. A European study, a little like this one from the United States, has paid forensic attention to what employers in a European country were looking for as they recruited people to low skilled jobs. Responsibility, flexibility, skills with customers, the ability to communicate, they even look for language abilities on the part of room staff in the hotel sector uh, and so on. The roll call of soft skills in a sense would be familiar to you. A McKinsey report uh, very aptly described such soft skills as hard work because it's not clear. We know more about how to teach people some of the intricacies of Java software than we know how to transmit and impart the soft skills that are incredibly valued by employers uh, in many customer facing uh, activities. The hard work of soft skills and clearly the provider of further education and training that is successful in inculcating and transmitting and fostering this is a set of attitudes, it's an attitude, it's a confidence and it has specific know-how uh, as to how, how you deal with customers and also uh, in those uh, set of situations, uh, such providers are worth their weight in gold. A, a third bit of good news from the labor market. We're thoroughly schooled in Ireland, I believe, about the requirements of jobs, the skill requirements of jobs that will be new to the economy. Uh, and if you look at the occupational forecasts that are used in the FET strategy, you will see that, gosh, if all goes well, by 2020, we'll have grown employment in Ireland by nearly 17%. Well, that's good news, and we need to get there. We'll, by then, we'll be just be about back to where we had been in 2006, with over 2 million people at work in Ireland. We've come down to under, we had come down to under 1 million employment jobs. 
and much of the skills analysis we get is based on when we get a, a, a study like this, the SINDA FSC strategy, it's comparing the skills profile of all those who will be at work in 2020 to the skills profile of all those who are wor at work in 2012, the base year. And you say, gosh, you know, when it's then, you're going to have, you know, what is it? Uh, there's a, you know, the red line is a 17% extra. You see there'll be above average growth in demand for those at the preferred level and those at the further education training level. And uh, below the higher secondary, the higher secondary, and the higher secondary is much less. I'll come back to that later. The trouble with that is that we are focusing just on where we get to, but not how we get there. And you see the distinction. The jobs that are important to your learners are not the jobs that don't now exist, but will exist in 2020. They're the jobs that need to be filled in a permanent way between now and 2020. And that's uh, replacement demand. The number of jobs that are now here that will be there in 2020, but whose current incumbent is going to retire, switch career, emigrate, or withdraw from the workforce for another reason. That's replacement demand. And it's massive compared to job creation. The figures are better provided in the United Kingdom and in the United States than in Ireland. But some of us are aware of this and believe, and they're onto it. But it's very important for parents and young people to realize that most of the permanent openings, the vacancies, the vacancies for permanent work that arise between now and 2020 aren't captured by asking what's different in 2020, they're captured by asking what happens between now and 2020. And when that's factored in, who is the most important provider of the skills needed in these jobs? It's not higher education, it's, it's your own sector. Uh, I have illustrated that. I don't know if it's, is there not so much with Irish differences in Ireland, but say with the uh, forecasts for employment from across the water. This shows they're, they're doing the same type of analysis that we regularly get in Ireland. By 2022 in their case, you see the demand for high skill jobs, there'll be so many more at work, medium skilled, low skilled actually, uh, uh, actually uh, collapsed. That's comparing where they get to in 2022 with where they were in 2012. But then they go on and say, well, what about job openings? What about the jobs that are there to be filled, permanent jobs to be filled? And of course, because the number of jobs described as low skilled are so massive, because so many in those jobs are going to retire, switch occupation, withdraw from the workforce, go back into home business, whatever, look at how different the jobs that have to be filled by those providing the skills training appear when you include uh, vacancy. So in filling those blue jobs and not just the new jobs, it's uh, so clear that the ability of people going into them should be deep in a way that they can contribute to changing the status and the productivity of jobs rather than just meeting short-term employer needs. And I think it's a, it's a huge question that's out there that we've yet to articulate as to what the extent to which the further education training sector adopts what I call a light approach and equips people with a safe pass, an ECDL, or another elementary requirement that meets the minimum regulatory or functioning requirements for a task or has the ambition and determination to go deeper and to give people such a mastery of these more soft skills 
that's the fundamentalist that raises the employability and the productivity. In summary, just from that view of you know, what's less known or, or less adverted to in how the labour market develops, three things. All eggs cannot be put in the higher education basket in meeting the economy's emerging skill needs. A very large number of the permanent jobs we build need do not need a higher education. And a major reconceptual second, a major reconceptualization is needed of, of many of the jobs that we currently refer to as low skilled. And thirdly, and I can't say much on this without your sector and the public employment service, intro and Department of Social Protection must develop a shared understanding and smooth procedures for identifying the amount of training that is required to help people who are long-term on the live register access their employment. Quickly moving to a a few thoughts on what it entails to become a more equal partner with higher education. I do believe it's time to leave behind the Cinderella status of the FET sector and for you to assume a real partnership with higher education. And that requires we must accept a mindset in the sector itself, as well as on the part of uh, the higher education sector and in society at large. It has to be noticed, and here I'd say, and to what extent are we? A third, we have to accept, we are so much a third level society in Ireland transfer rate directly from the completed high school, uh, secondary school to third level is huge and we're determined, to well we appear to be determined to go higher. Uh, this shows you the red bars are the uh, national objectives as submitted to the European Commission as to what proportion of 30 to 34 year olds in each member state of the European Union should have a tertiary attainment by the year 2020 yellow line is the European Union's target for 2020 and Ireland as you'll see in the next in the dark blue column is already well above the European Union's 2020 target but look at the Irish target for 2020 were to go even further ahead so it just confirms how much we do emphasize higher education in Ireland as the path to equal employment. But there are, I want just quickly, five things we must, we must note about what's now currently happening. The non-completion rates at third level vary hugely from as low as 8% for those who are studying a non-honours degree to as high as 31% at level six in the Institute of Technology. So the sector itself, the higher education sector itself is concerned that there are students accessing immediately, enrolling immediately in higher education for whom the sector is actually not delivering that well. Transitions into jobs for graduates have become more difficult and a large number of our graduates are now working in non-graduate jobs. Are you aware that the number, the proportion of waiters and waitresses who are graduates is now 31%? The proportion of sales staff, sales assistants who are graduates is 23%. Then there's emigration, and then there's evidence that not all who take graduates who take a non-graduate job as a temporary expedient escape to recover and access higher skilled employment. A significant number don't escape once they begin working in non-graduate jobs. So in short, there's all, in all likelihood, we already have a significant number of young people accessing, enrolling in higher education, whose aspirations and most beneficial patterns of learning and future employment prospects would be much better served if they were to receive quality further education at home. In second place, so 
that's saying that our emphasis in higher education is already leading to poor outcomes for a significant number who are in higher education. Then there's the what this emphasis in higher education has done to those not in the sector. It's clear that by best European standards, the vocational streams within our senior cycle, secondary level, are poorly developed and it's not sufficiently clear, clear for students where they need to be. That's not a phenomenon unique to Ireland. It's also clear that the number of apprenticeships routes has been limited and that's partly because, the, in part because employers' interest in apprenticeships and extending has waned as they discovered, well, we can start with graduates and give them on the job training for a year or more to bring them up to speed. And it's clear that the large number of graduates willing to take non-graduate jobs has bumped many FET graduates off the labour ladder. A seminal OECD study has warned of the potential boomerang effects of an educational ethos that assumes all students should ambition a university degree and that those not seeking or not prepared for university study risk being shut out or left adrift unless career pathways and vocational education training alternatives for them are strengthened. So I believe now is the time education and further education and training need to be conceptualized and planned for not separately but as a continuum because more than ever before in Ireland they are going to be serving the same people but at different moments in those people's lives not two sets of people not a fast track um, uh, a slow moving Ireland school completer who will prefer a two-year preparation for a specific area of employment and who later in her or his life may come looking for the opportunity to do a third level degree. And that's fine. And there's the graduate who having done a degree to find it hasn't been specifically focused or sufficiently focused on the real world of work and will come looking to the FET sector for their level five or level six that makes all the difference to their employability. And that's fine. So I had hoped to be able to say something very more substantive than I can feel, than I feel I now can do about looking for some quick wins as you show the wider Ireland and show our economic development agencies that you know we can deliver we will deliver and we will help this economy grow stronger and we'll help our labour market to become more inclusive so let me just in end by just putting four, uh, uh, I keep it to three thoughts where I think we need to quickly do something solid here would be a great sign of intent and of capacity to deliver. And the three thoughts are this. The higher education sector itself is doing a lot of work to show that they listen to the student and really feed and, and learn from what the student says as to whether or not are we, are we supporting them as best we can while they're with us and do they find what we did for them useful in later life and uh, I would recommend much uh, your perusing of the Irish Survey of Student Engagement ISSE that the DGA has developed and has put a lot of research into we need quickly to have something similar for the further education training sector the strategy says we want to set up a learn forum we want to have appropriate learner surveys. This is so important. Uh, we now have responsibility for training and vocational education, huge swathe and adult continuing education. We should be wanting really, let, let's conceptualize now a really good way of understanding how 
learners across these programs how experiencing what is done for them and how useful they find it afterwards so i feel there's a, there's a nerd who does not want to be learner centric today so there's a, a, an early you know a movement for immediate uh, action secondly you know you need some early wins as to which programs in fact are meeting this new type of demand for that I, I, I point to in our labour market and in the world of work. So you'll be aware that the terms of reference are now being finalised for a review, uh, the evaluation of the post leaving cert program. So there's a great one. Let this be good. So cooperate with that to the nth degree. It's a huge program. There's been this fundamental tension. Is this a holding pattern? holding ground until people get back into third level or is this of itself a valuable way to access these new demands so both the post leaving cert program and the new apprenticeship council that is to bring up on and, and stream new apprenticeships these are so important to get on to solid and say we want to see these things work and we want to be intimately involved with delivering the reform to the LC and we want to be intimately involved in delivering new apprenticeships and third and finally uh, I am aware and, and thank you for your, your close attention to date I still think for many in your sector it's, you know, it's strange that workforce development is now so much on the FET agenda and it's very clear that in many ways our background so far as to say by the composition of the EPD boards you seem a little unprepared for this particular emphasis but you are now in effect convening the equivalent of workforce development agencies in your areas so my third and final point is to say seize the opportunity in that to find allies to make friends and I'm stunned at how seldom education and training boards are present when economic, regional economic development is being discussed, planned and implemented. I think it's not that you've seceded the ground there to higher education institutions, is that the economic development, development agency and the stakeholders in economic development always just seem to think of higher education institutions when they're trying to say, you know, what are we going to do with the southeast region? What ambitions have they for the northwest? How are we going to dialogue with these new uh, reconstituted uh, regional, uh, regional authorities? Well, they're gone, but with the, the coalitions of local authorities that are now to front up economic development at a regional level. They don't come looking for the ETB. I think it's for the ETBs to go looking for them. And that a lot of a board members themselves in ETBs can't, someone has to be there where regional economic development is being discussed, explored and planned. Someone has to be there from your sector listening, discussing, feeding back and contributing. So that's my final point. So thank you very much uh, for your patience. Thank you.